Can you die of not writing a novel? I thought I could. I thought at one point I just about had. But of course, you have to very much want to write a novel to believe that you can die of not writing it. And I very, very much wanted to write a novel. And I wonder whether this little book here might have a clue as to why. This little book is my mother's diary. My mother died a couple of years ago at a good age, um, 97. Um, and it was in the middle of my writing, Mother's Boy. I'm not sure I'd called it Mother's Boy yet, but I had to call it Mother's Boy then. And this came to me into my possession not long after she died. It is the most wonderful thing. It is the diary of a 17 year old girl, as she was then, in the year 1940. Bombs are falling. She's going to like, she's uneducated. She left school at 14. She's working in a milliner's and she's collecting for hospitals. And, but she's reading everything. She's reading in the way that somebody who is doing a PhD in 19th century English literature wouldn't read today. She's reading everything. She's going to the theater. She is fantastic. I fell in love with my mother all over again because of course I'd been in love with my mother. What boy is, what Jewish boy isn't reading this diary. It's full of life, full of vitality. It's sharp. She's got loads of boyfriends, one of whom is my father. She's a bit worried about my father because she, she, she says at one point he's being a little too amorous. Isn't that one of, he's a little too amorous. And at one point he says to her, unless you kiss me, I'm gonna kill myself. She thinks that's unfair of him. Then he says, unless you kiss me, I'm gonna get drunk. I'm gonna go on a bender. And my father's idea of getting drunk is a kind of a very small lager and lime. So I can't see that ever happen. But in the end, he persuades her. He seems to have succeeded in persuading her by bringing her a box of black magic. Two years later, I am born. So there's, she's very young. You realize she, I'm, she's 19 when I am born. So between 1940 and 1942, everything's all right with my father. She marries him and I am born. This memoir begins uh, uncontroversially. Uh, with my being born. I'm in, my mother is in a nursing home in Presbury in Cheshire because the bombs are falling, still falling on London, but now they're really falling on London. Uh, and she's in this nursing home in Cheshire and it's one of the hottest summers, late August, one of the hottest summers there's ever been. Imagine my mother talking. This is one of the hottest summers there has ever been. And the, the labor that she's having with me is one of the nurses tell her, this is one of the hardest, longest, most painful labors there has ever been. And as she lies there for days, bathed in sweat, a spider crawls up onto the coverlet, crawls across her and settles on her belly, pretty well exactly where my brain would have been. So it becomes a kind of family mythology, or at least mythology between my mother and me, that a spider sat on my brain in my earliest years. I like this idea because it suggests that some emissary of hell has made some connection to me. I like the idea that, uh, that I am in this way destined for some uh, diabolic evil future. In fact, I'm a shy, uh, embarrassed, awkward, nervous mother's boy. As early as in the first few days of birth? Well, I actually think so. I argued with my mother that I could remember everything that happened. And she would say, that's just rubbish. My mother always said, everything was rubbish. Any exaggeration I made was rubbish. She could exaggerate all she liked. She could exaggerate about the spider. It turned out in a later account that that spider could have been a fly. For me, that fly will always be a spider. That was an emissary of the devil. But my mother would not allow my exaggerations because she wanted the world to be full of her exaggerations. She was, it was more, it was not some, it was more than ex exaggeration. It was catastrophe that she dealt in. She was a catastrophist. For example, let me just leap for a moment from my birth, though I might, I might go back to it. When I just, I got a letter that I was, I'd been in, I'd won a place at Cambridge. I'm 19 years old, 18, and a letter comes to say, you want a place at Cambridge. I tell my mother, I've got in, I've got in. 
the house goes very still. She says, let me just take a look at that. Let me just take a look at the envelope. Let's be absolutely certain it's meant for you. Now, you could think that's the most insulting thing a mother could say to her son, that this cannot be for you, it must be for somebody else. But I know it wasn't meant to be insulting. It was meant to be loving. She didn't want me to be disappointed. Why? If it was not meant for me, why would it not have been meant for me? Because life is full of catastrophes. Now I want to ask, how did this woman who is at 17 was such a live wire, how did she, so free, so easy, so clever, so bright, how in the course of a few years did she turn into this catastrophist? How indeed did my father, who was in love with her, um, would do anything for a kiss, turn into somebody, well, he actually didn't turn into somebody opposite to the person he'd been when he was young. He turned into somebody more like the person he'd been when he was young. My mother and my father, without knowing it, represent two sides of a serious historical split in Judaism. One of the great schisms in 18th century Juda Judaism was the schism between Lithuanian Jews and Ukrainian Jews. Ukrainian Jews produced Hasidism. That was that sort of muscular, hysterical, uh, um, how can we put it? They, they, they talked about the rabbis would come tumbling down from the Ukraine into the rest of Europe. They were faith healers. They were magicians. They were, it was a very, very uh, muscular and entertaining kind of Judaism. Across the way in the Baltic, in Lithuania, the Lithuanians are looking at this and saying, no, that's not what Judaism means. Judaism is something more austere, something more scholarly, something more altogether serious and spiritual and holy. My mother was from Lithuania. My father was from Ukraine. Between them, they held each, each side of this major difference between Jews. And I am in the middle of this. I am I am their battlefield, if you like. And this explains to me, they didn't know anything about it. This explains to me why in two years, my mother went from being that bright and breezy 17 year old to being a woman that was full of anxiety. Of course, something else had happened. She'd had a baby and we know what happens when you have a baby. The world suddenly becomes a more dangerous place. And my father went into the war. So for him too, the world had become a more dangerous place. But they then they fought the battle, this ancient, this ancient, this 18th century battle between two kinds of Judaism was fought out with me in the middle. It was so, I knew it to be absurd and I knew it to be preposterous while it was happening. And it's one of the reasons I think I wanted to be a writer. I thought I've got to, this is so strange and it's making me feel so peculiar. I've got to, to have this, these pressures on me because it was a pressure with my mother worrying about everything that I did and my father saying, no, don't treat the boy like that. My father wanted to me, he didn't want me to be a sportsman, but he wanted me, or he didn't want me to be rough, but he wanted me to have a bit more confidence. He wanted me to be a sport. He was always complaining that I wasn't a sport. When we went on holiday and we'd go to a pantomime and the, and the people on the stage of the pantomime would say, okay, all the kids under 12, come up on the stage, I'd hide. I'd be hiding under the seat. My father would grab me by my neck, get up, get up, go on there. He'd make me enter competitions. There's a little photograph of me somewhere in, in there wearing um, those Brillo pad trunks um, and my fists like that, trying to look in it. It was a Just William competition for my dad, trying to look like a tough guy. It's the saddest thing you've ever seen in your life. I didn't want to be like that. I didn't want to, I didn't live in my body. Like my mother, my mother didn't live in her body. I lived in my mind. In fact, I lived in my mother's mind. My father wanted to get me out of my mother's mind, who can say he was wrong. And he wanted to get my mother out of my mind. He didn't succeed, though it is the case that when I did finally get to, when I was finally able to write, um, I probably became a lot more like my father. It probably took my father to do it. I wanted to be my father, though I was my, though I was my mother. Another example of my mother's catastrophism. I mean, think of this, she rings me up at one point 
whenever she rang, whenever she rang me up, the phone would be this implement of wild exaggeration. It was she held hyperbole in her hand, and she would say, "Oh, Howard, I can't tell you." I'd say, "Okay, what is it, Howard? I can't, I can't sleep. I can't." I said, "What is it? What's the matter?" It's Stephen. Stephen was my younger brother. That's another story. Younger brothers are a problem for older brothers. Stephen, I'm so worried about Stephen. What's the matter with Stephen? He's just moved, he's just gone to art college. He's just moved into a house with five girls. Five, five girls? I'm so, what, why are you so, five girls? I said, what are you worried about? I can't sleep at night. I said, it's possible Stephen can't sleep at night either. She said, don't make fun. Five girls, Howard. He's never gonna be able to get to the bathroom. The bathroom, you see, the bathroom was the secret of my mother's anxieties. The bathroom was the place where we could not hide our bodies. When I went off to when I went off to um, to Cambridge, finally, when she accepted that I had indeed won a place, she said, "Will you remember to take toilet rolls?" I said, "What for the whole three years?" It, it, she said, "They might not have any." I said, "Look, I'm sure. I'm sure at Cambridge." She said, "Look, just take toilet rolls." So I listened to her and I took a couple. The I'm just going to, this is going to go off and it's going to spoil a story. Um, and the story is this. Whenever anybody in our house went to the lavatory, the rest of the house, if they were upstairs, had to come downstairs. We were not to acknowledge that the body existed. So any of the slight noises that a body might make were not to be heard by the rest of the house. So the word would go out, your mother's upstairs or your father's upstairs or Howard's upstairs or Stephen's upstairs in the toilet. The rest of the house would move downstairs and we'd start singing. So we couldn't hear any noises. So we'd sing, it would vary. We would sing a selection from the song, from the, from the musicals. And once I even remember um, a whole chorus of um, the Hallelujah Chorus. You would think, wouldn't you, that a boy with this all going on around him, with his parents fighting this ancient war between different kinds of Judaism, it would be a doddle to write novels. It would be dead easy. Who could You couldn't fail. My problem was that I'd grown ashamed of it all. Terrible thing to happen, but it happened. I'd grown ashamed of my mother. I'd, have I told you that my father was a, was, a, was a magician? Have I told you that my father bent six inch nails? Have I told you that my father ripped telephone directories in half? Have I told you that my father at weddings and bar mitzvahs used to, used to dance the Kazatsky like a Cossack and used to lift up, chair, lift, lift up chairs by one leg, sometimes with me in them. So I'm ashamed of my father doing this. Then my mother is in a corner holding her head, ashamed of him. And I'm ashamed of my mother for being ashamed of my father. So what kind of shame, in order to get away from this shame, I decide, yes, I have to write. I'm this alienated, peculiarized being and I have to write, but I have to write about anything other than this world. And what do I want to write about? I want to write about what Henry James wrote about. I want to write about English country house life. And I want to write it in elegant Henry James sentences. I came from a world in which my father told me off in kind of cod Yiddish. I worked on the markets with him and we had kind of market slang. Uh, my mother had her own um, fantastic language of, oh, I can't, Howard, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. And I am wanting to write Henry James prose. Well, psychologically, you can understand it. I need to get away from all that. But you can't write like that. You can't write another person's life for them. I am not saying that it was my job to write about the life I lived. I don't say only write about what you know, because writing, what's important about writing, I think sometimes, is that you don't know what you know, and you write to find out what you know. But what I did wrong, it seems to me, um, was to miss out on the music of the life that I lived, was to not honor the cadences, the extravagance, the inordinacy, and the huge comedy of it. And this, my little memoir, is quite simply the story of how I finally got to write a novel um, by giving up the whole idea of Henry James and realizing I couldn't do it, or Tolstoy, or Dostoevsky, and not writing the story of my parents and my life there, but realizing I, the life that I'd been brought up into was funny, that they were funny and that they were exuberant. And I had to find a language of exuberance 
comic exuberance in which to write whatever it was I had to write. And it's a happy story, this. It stops with my first novel. Uh, it's published. That's it, the end. But at least I wrote it. And it's lovely to be here, although I can't see any of you, but I can imagine you and be talking to you about it again. Rosie, thank you for inviting me.